Okay, I'm just, uh, good afternoon. I'm just gonna find my slide uh, show uh, and I may need a little assist here <laughs> as others. Uh, good afternoon once again. Uh, thank you very much for the introductions. Uh, before I get started, I just want to uh, echo uh, the sentiments of other participants uh, about how, what a wonderful opportunity it is to participate in the Schwidler project uh, and to share ideas with other scholars and to, and to share our preliminary work uh, with all of you today. Uh, so the title of my, my talk is A Retort to Fascist Cannibals, the 1939 exhibit The Jews in Tsarist Russia and the USSR at the State Museum of Ethnography in Leningrad. And the image that you see here is, is of the State Museum of Ethnography uh, in Leningrad, which was founded, officially opened in 1934. Uh, and, uh, and has since been reincarnated after the fall of the Soviet Union into the Russian Museum of Ethnography uh, in, in St. Petersburg. Uh, so you can go there today, uh, it's, it's under a different name. And today what I wanna talk about is the, what might seem come as something of a surprise that in the late 1930s, the Soviet state would uh, sponsor and subsidize a very ambitious and physically large uh, and, and thematically complex uh, ethnographic exhibit in the heart of, of a major city, Leningrad, devoted to the subject of Jews. Uh, and um, <clears throat> I wanna say just a couple of words about uh, the basic concept of the State Museum of Ethnography. Uh, ethnographic knowledge was politicized uh, heavily in the Soviet Union, and the ethnographic museum itself was envisioned as a tool of, uh, of propaganda, we would say. Uh, from their perspective, they would say it's a tool of political enlightenment. Uh, and uh, it consisted of research divisions organized on along Republican lines. Uh, so in other words, the museum had special research divisions devoted to each major people of the Soviet Union for whom there was a republic. So there was a department uh, for the study of the Ukrainian, of peoples of the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, of Belarusia, Georgia, uh, of course, uh, uh, Russians as well. And the idea was um, to, first of all, gather material about these various peoples of the Soviet Union uh, in order to uh, document their ostensible progress along the kind of evolutionary Marxist timeline. And the way that the museum exhibits typically worked, uh, and it was and continues to be actually a very a popular museum, but uh, the idea was to educate Soviet citizens um, along the notions of a before and after concept. So you might think of it a little bit as, uh, if you've been to the Museum of Natural History, uh, in New York, uh, and you see these uh, dioramas, life-size reconstructions of scenes from prehistoric life behind glass, uh, except that in, the, uh, in this case, you would see scenes of, of life among various peoples during Imperial Russia, uh, when, uh, of course, according to the narrative, life was terrible under the Tsars, uh, and minorities were persecuted, and the quality of life was very low, and then you would have a kind of after uh, uh, demons, uh, representation. As you move through the exhibit, there would be more life-size dioramas and displays and photographs and charts showing how wonderful life was for all the peoples who, uh, of the Soviet Union who had previously been persecuted by, uh, by, the, imperial, by the imperial authorities. Uh, the, the only uh, sort of question, however, was what do you do with uh, so-called extraterritorial peoples? Uh, those who didn't have their own republics, uh, of which there were many. There were over a hundred different ethnic minorities in the, in the Soviet Union, uh, and the Jews were a very good example of this. Uh, do we uh, depict Jews in, within each individual exhibit in the Ukrainian, sec you know, the exhibit for Ukrainians, uh, the exhibit for Belarusians, and so forth, or should we actually give the Jews their own section? And this was uh, a topic of debate uh, 
that, that, that really got underway shortly after the museum itself opened in 1934 and continued through, through the establishment of a Jewish section in, in 1937, which I'll, which I'll get to uh, in, a, in a moment. Uh, the, the future director uh, of what would become the Jewish section of the State Museum of Ethnography uh, was a young up-and-coming ethnographer named Isaiah Mendeleevich Pulner, uh, who had left his native shtetl uh, to come and study uh, ethnography in, in Ukraine. And in 1931, and again, this is before the museum actually officially opened, uh, he wrote kind of a debut article in the journal Soviet Ethnography, where he, uh, he himself addressed the question, you know, how should Jews be, be represented ethnographically in, uh, in ethno ethnographic museums in the Soviet Union? Uh, and, and he argued at this point in time, very vociferously, that there should not be a single Jewish section representing Jews, that there was no such thing as a unified Jewry. Uh, and that indeed it was, it was in fact only uh, anti-Semites on the one hand and Zionists on the other who would argue that there was a united Jewish people. Uh, and he criticized the uh, actually fairly recent tradition of Jewish museums in Western Europe and the United States for creating the facade or mirage of Jewish unity, that having something like a Jewish museum implied that there was something called the Jewish people and that they were united. Uh, and the task of, Soviet ethno uh, of Jewish ethnography in the Soviet context would be to unmask uh, the class, uh, the dimensions that had been, that, that, that had been concealed in, in, in Western Jewish ethnographic scholarship. So his argument in 1931 uh, was that, that Jews uh, should be represented according to their uh, Republican status. So Jews, and he divided Jews of the Soviet Union into five categories. There were Western Jews, which loosely corresponds to European or Ashkenazi Jews, uh, and those uh, groups should be represented respectively in the departments for, uh, for, U for Ukraine, for Belarus, uh, for Russia, and so forth. Then there was a separate category, the Jews in the Soviet Republic of Georgia, Yet another category were mountain Jews, Crimean Jews, and finally uh, the Jews of Central Asia. And each one of these groups should be dealt with separately within their own socioeconomic geographic uh, context. Now, uh, the, the, I will just throw out the fact that Polnar himself was an expert in, Jew, in Georgian Jews, Jews of the Caucasus. Uh, and yet, ironically, when the time comes after a series, uh, after a series of debates in the mid-1930s, how should we represent Jews in the museum, Polner is appointed to head a newly established Jewish section that does exactly the opposite of what he proposed in 1931. Uh, it brings together all of the Jews of the Soviet Union under one umbrella. Uh, and uh, and the, the uh, very first task that he has is to curate a very ambitious and large exhibit that, would, would, that opened uh, two years later in 1939, entitled The Jews in Tsarist Russia and the USSR, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more uh, in a moment. But there were a couple of factors going on uh, that, that, went, that went into the decision to create a Jewish section uh, at the museum. Uh, one pragmatic question was simply financing. Where would the museum be likely to get the most donations, the most funding uh, within the Soviet Union? Well, probably it's going to be organizations dedicated to agricultural colonization uh, and modernization of European Jews. So there was a financial issue, but then, of course, there was also, and then the, here is this, this is where the, the phrase, a retort to fascist cannibals comes in, is uh, that there was, uh, as, as, we, as we know, uh, uh, increasingly uh, propaganda coming out of, of, uh, of, of Germany uh, about, about uh, racial, with racialized images of Jews, uh, and, and it's probably no accident that in 1937, the same year that the Jewish section was established in, in, at the museum in Leningrad, uh, the exhibit The Eternal Jew opened up in, in, in Munich. 
uh, in which, and the images here speak for, for, speak for themselves. Uh, so in, his, uh, in the archived memoranda of the museum where Polner, we can go back and look at what Polner was, had in mind when he conceived of the exhibit, how he decided to curate it, one of the, one of the driving motives was that the 1939 exhibit and really the work of the Jewish section it itself should constitute, quote unquote, a retort to the fascist cannibals and their an allegations, their anti-Semitic allegations uh, about Jews. Uh, but there were also some uh, purely political, ideological uh, factors that went into the, to the decision to create a Jewish section as well. You see here, this is a, a rare photograph, it's not a very good quality, uh, a rare photograph of one of the opening entrance to the, the 1939 exhibit. Uh, and you can see that there is very prominently displayed a bust of Stalin. Uh, and in the internal memoranda that are preserved today in the archives of the Russian Ethnographic Museum, uh, there is, we can trace a debate about, you know, what are, the, what are the different factors for why we should or should not bring all the Jews together uh, under one, so to speak, ethnographic roof. Uh, and one of the concerns, as you can see from this, this quote, is, well, if, if we distribute, if we represent Jews in every single republic where they happen to live and they're scattered throughout the Soviet Union, we're going to have to thank comrades Stalin, Molotov, and Kalinin in every single division uh, for their benevolent policy towards the Jews. Uh, and that's going to uh, perhaps uh, make, make our, uh, you know, go a little overboard in our attempts to, to, to counter Nazi propaganda. Uh, so that was is no less of a factor in the decision to, to really essentially reverse the original plan that, that Polner had proposed. Um, the actual exhibit, uh, and, and, and again, I want to stress that this was really, this, this took up multiple rooms. Uh, it consisted of 50, 50 different displays uh, of life-size recreations of various scenes from Jewish life. Uh, photographs, uh, maps, charts, text, etc. Uh, and, and one thing I just want to say very briefly is where did all of this stuff, where did the artifacts come from, namely for, uh, specifically for the pre-revolutionary period? Uh, well, really, they go, we have to go back uh, to the Anski expedition uh, into the Pale of Jewish Settlement uh, in 1912 to 1914. Uh, when the great writer uh, and, uh, and, and folklorist uh, Anski collected materials uh, and, with the, and, and established a museum at the Jewish Historical and Ethnographic uh, Societies uh, in, in uh, what was Petersburg, uh, Petrograd at that point. Uh, and, um, and when Ansky fled the so when he fled Soviet Russia in 1918, he left uh, many of the most of the artifacts that he had collected, including things that were very valuable: silver candelabra, spice boxes, uh, various ornaments, uh, costumes, etc., that he had collected during his travels in the Pale. Uh, he left it in the care of the Russian museum system that was also linked to, the, to what would become the Ethnographic Museum. His idea was that he would come back and reclaim these materials, but he died. Uh, and in the meantime, in, in the intervening time, the Soviet regime nationalized uh, these, these, uh, these artifacts, which was a nice way at the time of saying that they stole them, uh, and, and shut down. Uh, and by 1930, uh, the Jewish Historical and Ethnographic Museum was shut down, uh, and uh, these, all of those materials were transferred from the museum to what would eventually become the State Museum of Ethnography. Uh, Pulner at this time was a graduate student, and the linkage is that he was assigned at this point, and this was in the, in the 20s, to catalog the Ansky collection. Uh, so he was deeply familiar with, with the materials, he was very familiar with the methodology practiced by Ansky, but he was also somebody who had to make a career within, within the Soviet system, uh, which, and in a sense, his, his arguments in his 1931 article were sort of his debut as a good Marxist scholar. Uh, so a little bit, a little bit about how the museum was was organized. Uh, like other uh, exhibits at the ethnograph at the State Museum of Ethnography, the, the this exhibit followed the formula of before 1917 and after 1917. And what I'm showing here are some images from an exhibit guidebook that was published 
which is probably one of the better, it's, it's one of the most important sources we have for, for how the exhibit was structured because many of the materials were damaged during the war and there are a lot of photographs that, are, that either have been lost or, or only exist as negatives. So you see that for in, in, on, the, on the left there's the opening pages of the uh, exhibit guide uh, which shows a picture of uh, the shtetl uh, uh, produced by the artist Solomon Udovin and, uh, and the title says it all, The Jews in Tsarist Russia in the Prison House of Peoples. Uh, and there is a quote from Lenin prominently displayed here uh, where he says not, uh, that, that, that of all the nationalities in the Tsarist Empire, it was the Jews that were persecuted the most. Uh, so we have the authority of Lenin coming in here from the very beginning. And then as the exhibit continues, the second half is entitled, as you can see on the right, the Jews in the USSR in the socialist homeland of workers. And here, interestingly, we, we have a, a, a quote from Molotov uh, saying uh, that, the solution, that the resolution of the nationality problem in the Soviet Union is the most pressing question of the day. Uh, and, and here, in, in, you know, whereas before we had the old dilapidated rundown shtetl, uh, now we have a, a, an image of a young Jewish girl uh, who is on the uh, on the cover of a rep uh, of a copy of the Soviet con of the Stalinist con Stalin Constitution from 1936 published in Yiddish, uh, and uh, and and so the 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 contrast uh, is is pretty is pretty self evident. Uh, a number of uh, themes were emphasized. Uh, so if you imagine moving moving your way through this exhibit. Uh, you would encounter, and again, these are very grainy photographs. It's it's very hard to get a decent reproduction. But uh, here on the on the on the left is a reproduction uh, of a cheder, uh, and again we have the image of this very same schoolgirl uh, contrasting uh, the the uh, the the oppressive traditions, pr oppressive religious traditions of the old world, and the wonderful opportunities uh, for for childhood and for Jews in the in the in the, in the new. Soviet period. Uh, another theme that was stressed was the Jewish autonomous region in, in the Soviet Far East, which was very explicitly posited as, an, an, as the antithesis to the old world of the shtetl. Uh, and uh, there were, again, these, these reproductions, uh, one depicting uh, the, the conquering of nature, the mastering of the taiga, uh, another one, the construction of the collective farm in the name of, of Kirov, which, the, which would have been um, uh, uh, populated by, by these new Jewish pioneers coming to uh, the Soviet uh, Soviet uh, Jewish homeland, as it were. Um, but I want to also uh, talk a little bit about some nuances in the text and in the exhibit itself uh, that I think are important to situate within the context of the late 1930s. So, um, so directly opposite an image of the old Jewish shtetl, which depicts Jewish craftsmen, uh, very narrow streets, uh, crowded, dilapidated buildings, uh, is a quote by Lenin. Uh, where he says, uh, there's no doubt that only extreme poverty can force people to abandon their homeland. Uh, the implication being and that, that Jews would never have left en masse uh, starting in 1881 if they had been treated better by, 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 uh, uh, by, the, the, by the imperial regime. Uh, and then what's interesting is that immediately following Lenin's quote is, uh, is a quote by the great uh, Yiddish writer Mendel and Mocher Sporim, uh, where he is quoted in Russian translation, the original is not cited in the, in the guide, but Mendela says, for us, the country where many generations of our ancestors were born and died, the country where we ourselves were born, work, and will die, is our homeland. No force is capable of severing that blood bond linking us and our children to the soil of Russia. Uh, so there's a very strong stress on the notion of uh, Jewish uh, patriotism and citizenship uh, and, and a strong, and, and, the, and the words themselves, rodina and homeland and, 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 and uh, blood bond, uh, uh, make it very clear in this, in this uh, pamphlet and in the exhibit itself that Jews have an organic connection to Russia, or to the Soviet Union specifically, but also to, to Russia historically. Uh, another major theme of the exhibit was uh, the power of Jewish folk culture. 
Uh, and the, so for example, the tradition of the Purim spiel is highlighted here uh, as, as a kind of example of, 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 of the innate inclination of the Jewish working class to resist uh, repression uh, and, uh, and 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 um, and and to fight back, uh, and the, this is juxtaposed with a quote in the text, and it, people would have seen this when they were going through the exhibit. Quote: The rich treasures of Jewish folk art expose at the very root the claims of fascist cannibals that the Jewish people lack any aptitude for great creativity, since of course much of the Nazi anthropological propaganda about Jews was saying that. Uh, you know, Jews were essentially cultural parasites who could not create any of their own uh, 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 cultural masterpieces. Uh, and that this same sense of, of a, a natural sense of justice and natural resistance to oppression implicitly could be adapted to the present time of the late 1930s. Uh, nonetheless, there was also attention given to the contribution of, of uh, Jewish culture uh, on the world stage. Again, a retort, uh, you could say, to allegations uh, that, that Jews had no, no cultural ca capabilities of their own coming out of Nazi propaganda. So there were, there were uh, prominent displays devoted, of course, to the Yiddish classicers, uh, Mendela and Sholem Aleichem, uh, Goldfaden, uh, the father of the Yiddish theater, and, and interestingly also Antokolsky, Mark Antokolsky, uh, who was a, 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 you know, a very well-known and important Russian Jewish sculptor in the late imperial period who under other circumstances would have been seen as very bourgeois uh, by, by the Soviet authorities, uh, but he here is also invoked uh, as an example of the contribution of Jews from this region to, to world culture. Interestingly, uh, even though Polner, the director and curator of this whole project, even though he was a specialist in the Jews of, of the Caucasus, uh, they get short shrift here. Uh, and remember, we started out with this argument in 1931 that all of these different groups should be given uh, their own separate uh, uh, due in different sections. Here in this exhibit, they get only uh, the equivalent of two pages out of a 47-page uh, brochure. The overwhelming focus is on, on European Jewry or Ashkenazi Jewry. Uh, and their accomplishments uh, and, and, uh, and, and uh, contributions. An interesting aspect of, uh, of, 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 this, of the materials that have been left behind is that like other, like other museum exhibits, uh, there were books left uh, where visitors could leave their comments. Uh, and this was very typical of, of uh, well, it's still typical of most uh, museum exhibits today as well. Uh, but what we find in the archival records is some surprisingly candid comments on the part of visitors uh, responding to, to what they saw in the exhibit. And uh, on the one hand, towards the left, we have uh, the impressions of an enthusiast who wrote, I myself am a Jew, I saw the Jewish shtetl with my own eyes, I myself studied in a cheder and lived in a poor Jewish family. It is a good thing that we now see this only in a museum. Long live Leninist Stalinist nationality policy. And I want to remind you that this was a voluntary. Nobody was being forced to write in these uh, in, in these in these visitor books. Although people were forced uh, to go, uh, people didn't really have much of a choice about going to the exhibit. School children were brought, workers were brought from factories, and so forth. But there were also more candid complaints and comments. And and uh, one of them, for example, complained that there wasn't enough representation of the Jewish intelligentsia in the present. Uh, another, com another visitor complained, why isn't there anything here about Crimean Jews? Uh, and then a couple of real dissenters uh, left these notes. One said, when did Jews become a nation in the Marxist sense? Uh, and, and another concluded uh, in his comment, in in, I believe it was a he, uh, because they did leave their names typically, uh, in a word, the Jewish people have learned nothing from history. Uh, so, so there is a, a certain degree of candor that was, that was left in these visitor comment books and Polner actually responded uh, and wrote down responses in the visitor books, perhaps assuming that these people would come back or for the benefit of other, uh, of other uh, visitors. Uh, now, this exhibit opened in March of 1939. Uh, and you can imagine uh, the surprise of the curators who had done such a hard job, uh, had worked so hard to 
offer up a retort to the fascist cannibals when suddenly the Soviet Union enters into a non-aggression pact with those very same fascist cannibals. Uh, and uh, so one of the, uh, of the, among the secret protocols of the Hitler-Stalin non-aggression pact uh, was the, div the divvying up of Poland into spheres of influence. Uh, and even though it would seem ideologically that this, that the introduction of the non-aggression pact might have upended the point of the exhibit, the whole concept behind it, in fact it didn't. The exhibit continued, it was very well attended, uh, it remained open until the eve of the, un until the eve of the Nazi invasion, and according to museum archival records, uh, was slated to become a permanent exhibit. So if anything, uh, it, the, the status of the Jewish section was strengthening uh, at the very same time that, that the Soviet Union entered into this pact uh, with Nazi, Nazi Germany. Uh, and and I'll, I'm going to bring this shortly to a conclusion, but what did, what did the division of Poland mean for the Jewish section and for Polner? Uh, Polner, in his archival records, repeatedly, claim, repeatedly complains to museum personnel uh, that, uh, that he doesn't have enough ethnographic material. Uh, and in a sense, he, he comes close to saying that, that uh, the Soviet Union has done too good of a job assimilating its Jews, uh, and that he doesn't have enough, as it were, authentic material, uh, and he clearly wants more. Uh, and he says in one of his memos in, uh, to, the, to the museum uh, uh, directorship, remnants of the Jewish past are perishing with incredible rapidity as a result of the socialist construction of life and culture of the Jewish population in the USSR. And he sees in the annexed territory of, of Poland an opportunity to go back in time, as it were, but really in the present, to retrieve some kind of, to, to collect and document what he is implicitly saying is really authentic Jewish culture. Uh, and so on the, on the eve, uh, very close, uh, I believe the, the date of his, his memorandum is dated June 4th, 1941. Uh, he writes out a plan for the next several years, the plan of work for the Jewish section. Uh, and among the tasks that he wants to carry out in the very, literally within the next few months, and this is June, early June 1941, is to go to the uh, Soviet, uh, Soviet occupied Poland and collect ethnographic material. He wants to use that material to expand the exhibit that again is still on display. He wants to catalog the inventory and to compile uh, bibliographies and materials uh, in, in Yiddish, uh, Hebrew, Russian, and other languages. And he also wants to take the exhibit on the road. Uh, in particular, he wants to take sort of mini versions of the exhibit and bring it to the provinces and, uh, pu and put on display uh, uh, exhibits about uh, the pre-revolutionary shtetl or in particular the Jewish woman in Tsarist Russia and the USSR. Needless to say, he doesn't get the chance. Uh, shortly afterwards, uh, later in that very same month, uh, the Nazis invade uh, the Soviet Union, and, uh, and, then we, and then we have the siege of Leningrad, during which time the Ethnographic Museum, uh, like every, every other institution in Leningrad, uh, is desperately trying to protect uh, its holdings and just simply survive. Uh, and Polner, along with many other colleagues at the museum, he, they literally lived at the museum and tried to protect the artifacts. Uh, and he, along with many others, starved to death during the siege of Leningrad. Uh, <clears throat> after, uh, after the war, uh, as we know, we see the, the, uh, the anti-cosmopolitan campaign, uh, and the, the uh, you know, it's very likely that somebody like Pulner might have been caught up in that, uh, uh, probably would have been, uh, but while the State Museum of Ethnography, of course, is reopened after, after the war, the Jewish section is not. Uh, and uh, essentially the materials uh, remain, you know, languishing behind closed doors for the remainder of the Soviet Union. Uh, <clears throat> and although there is uh, some revived interest in the legacy of the, uh, of the Jewish section on the pages of the journal of the Soviet journal, Sovietish Hemland, uh, starting in late, the late 1960s and through uh, the early 1980s, we get a, a smattering of articles uh, about the Jewish collections, again, which are not accessible to anyone, uh, but a description of them. Uh, some bio, uh, biographical profiles of Polner, uh, who had not been spoken about for, for, for decades. 
Uh, but the but the exhibit the, the materials themselves do not um, uh, ever get shown to the public until after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And you can go today to the Russian Ethnographic Museum, which has uh, ex excavated and recovered the materials that were essentially lost and re-inventoried them, at least those that, were, that survived the war. And you can go and see much of the material that was originally collected by Ansky. Uh, but nonetheless, there remains relatively little knowledge of the history of the Jewish section and its activities in the late 1930s. Um, so I would just, I would think I would just close out by, by raising some, some questions uh, about how do we evaluate the fact that the Soviet state put, put this effort into representing Jews uh, at the very same time that the Soviet Union entered into a non-aggression pact uh, with, uh, with, with Nazi Germany. Um, and, uh, and, and what did it mean uh, to, to put this material out in front of the Soviet public? Uh, and, and I would suggest that as much as this was obviously a propaganda, a highly ideologically inflected propaganda project uh, intended to glorify the accomplishments of, the, of, 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 the, of Soviet nationality policy, that inadvertently uh, those going to, to see the exhibit would have also been exposed to aspects of traditional Jewish life. Uh, so, th so that at the same time that they are being indoctrinated, uh, the, the, the legacy of the pre-revolutionary pre Jewish heritage is also being kept out in the public eye. So I will leave it, leave it at that. Thank you very much. Um, hi. Um, again, I want to join my colleagues in thanking uh, um, Gennady Estre, first of all, for bringing us all together, and for Nad to Nadia Alkai, who's uh, here for coordinating. It's a great honor to be part of this uh, uh, Schwedler project. And um, now, I hope the technology is on my side. I want to play to you a little bit of music. And you can read a little bit of Adolf Hitler, Breuner, Homan, Zwartav, Dira, Grover, Stick, Irn, Boyen, Abdai, Nome, Nakladet, Koran, Antik, Zuder, Kvura, Veldin, Brengin, Unser, Stalin, Unser, Glick, Wundein, Rachter, Seifert, Hingen, Gerin, Gebert, Hitler, Frick. Okay, and a little bit more. Und ein Linker wird sich wiegen, Rosenberg und Riebentrop, in der da rein wird's fliehen mit Wissen, Koparov. Und mir werden die Vagroben an so tief in der da rein, von dein Padle, von dein Grober, so kein Stinke, die Schnitt nein. Ai, 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 ai. Ah, thank you. I will pass it on. Uh, so the song you just heard in a beautiful performance by Psoy Karalenko, you'll see his face later, uh, was uh, first recorded from a woman named Shifra Perlina, a young Jewish woman born in a small town in Lithuania, who sang this song to a folklore collector, whose name we don't know, in Almata in Kazakhstan in 1943. This song is discussed in an article written by Hirschel, by, by Hirschel Blostein, a Yiddish poet. He submitted this article for the publication in Soviet Yiddish Weekly Anikite, sorry, Soviet Yiddish uh, Every 10 Day uh, Publication Anikite. Uh, and the, um, uh, this article was called New Yiddish Folklore. In that article, he spends about a page and a half talking that 1943, is the year of great victories in world in the great patriotic war. And this is the year when Jewish people celebrate their victory over fascism. Indeed, Soviet Yiddish folk songs began celebrating victory in World War II two years before the war had actually ended. And these celebrations were full with calls for violent revenge 
and ridicule of the German army that attempted to destroy the Soviet Union and succeeded in destroying so many Jews. In the song you just heard, and you're reading uh, probably again and again those lyrics, Adolf Hitler is compared with Haman, I think it was on the previous slide, uh, Brown Haman, from the Purim story, an evil state official who plotted to destroy Jewish people. In Soviet Yiddish culture of the war, Hitler and Haman are used interchangeably. Uh, in uh, literature, in songs, even on, as I learned from Arkady Zelter, on gravestones. So, importantly, this song addresses the war as the war specifically against Jews, not the war against all Soviet people. The victory is a Jewish affair, often celebrated in Hebrew-derived words in Yiddish. For example, there is another song from a collection of which I'll speak in a second, written in 1945, also in Kazakhstan, which has the following words. I'll read to you in Yiddish first. Hitler hot dima pole, Stalin hot dimam shole, far hidden dire fole. Hitler has the downfall, Stalin has the power, and the Jews have been saved. This idea of a Jewish victory, which appears in Yiddish songs, jokes, stories, legends, and parables, all written in the Soviet Union during the war, is not the sentiment that we commonly associate with the Soviet story of World War II. Other sources, of which actually we've heard a lot uh, in the first uh, section today, and yesterday certainly a lot, such as wartime letters, diaries, also written by Jews, but in Russian, tell quite a different story. Many of them emphasize that Soviet Jews fought the war as Soviet citizens, not as Jews. They tell a story of Soviet Jews not thinking about being Jewish unless being reminded. That's the, uh, that's the sentiment with which Oleg Budnitsky finished his presentation about uh, uh, a Jewish woman serving in the Red Army. And of course, Almost all post-war testimonies and memoirs of uh, Jews participating in the war in the Red Army share more or less this sentiment. They were fighting the war as Jews, as Soviet citizens, unless being reminded that they were Jewish. We need to turn to Yiddish language folklore um, from the time of the war in order to get a different perspective. So this paper is part of a larger project on which I'm working on right now, entitled Yiddish Culture in the Soviet Union during World War II. And it is based partially on the archive of the Kiev Cabinet for Jewish Proletarian Culture, a research lab that collected hundreds of folk stories in songs and songs in Yiddish during World War II in the Soviet Union. Starting from 1941, when many Jews were on trains being evacuated to Central Asia uh, and the uh, uh, central parts of the Soviet Union. They recorded those Yiddish uh, songs and stories in Central Asia itself between 1942 and 1946. Once Ukraine was liberated in 1944, the cabinet went back to Ukraine, and as early as 1944, they went to those newly liberated territories that formerly under Romanian occupation, looked for Jewish survivors, and recorded their songs. They conducted at least seven of those expeditions in Chernovitz and Odessa in 1944, 45, 46, 47. In addition, this archive contains letters from Red Army soldiers who, believe it or not, sometimes would write a song about what happened to them in Yiddish and mail those letters to the cabinet. So the archive contains those materials as well. In addition, some of those uh, folk Yiddish folk materials are uh, in the archive of the Soviet Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee, uh, which is uh, thankfully now located in the United States Holocaust Museum, which we can um, access a lot easier than the documents in Kiev. So one feature of these materials is that they provide the running commentary on the news which were relevant to the Jewish audience in 1943 and 1944. 
So in this song that you just heard, we see the names discussed in Soviet newspapers of the time. German propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels, the president of Reichstag, Goering, minister of internal affairs William Frick, Nazi, Nazi ideologue Alfred Rosenberg, and of course, uh, Johann Ribbentrop, we just saw his picture earlier, uh, from Debbie, and of course, Adolf Hitler himself. As you all know, all these German officials died a natural death. Rosenberg and Goering were convicted in the Nuremberg trial and committed suicide. And Freak, Ribbentrop, and Rosenberg were also convicted and were indeed hung. But the song, so the song predicts this unnatural death, chillingly in a joking matter, in 1943. And speaking of unnatural death, one of the important features of the songs written in 1943 and 44 are the graphic, detailed description of violence against Germans. Germans are sliced, slaughtered like animals, hung on trees, and cut into pieces. Verbally, Hitler is cursed too. All the resources of the Yiddish language are put into the mission of virtual destruction of the enemy. Now, just as enthusiastically as these songs curse Hitler, they praise Stalin. In the one you just heard, we see Unser Stalin, Unser Glück, our joy. And Stalin is praised very genuinely, very differently compared to the 1930s when this praise seemed artificial and forced. Now, my first book was about Soviet Yiddish culture in the 30s, and I studied songs specifically, so I've done a lot of research on how Stalin is portrayed in the Yiddish folklore of the 30s. And I could say with a degree of authority, I hope, that uh, going through the materials uh, actually in Kiev, uh, at the, at the music arc, uh, the, a lot of musical, um, a lot of songs there from the 30s and 20s, I have yet to find a genuine folk song written before 1930. Uh, 1942 that praises Stalin. There are some famous ones such as Lomer Trinken Alechaim for the Liebenhaver Stalin became very famous written in the 30s. But that what happens was that the song was recorded, didn't have Stalin in it. They would add a verse about Stalin and publish it like this. So it was uh, kind of the effort to Sovieticize the Yiddish uh, folklore in the 30s. But in the 40s, it does not happen. In the 40s, I see those field notes, and starting from 1942, but especially in 1943, Joseph Stalin is a central character in the songs where he is in almost every song. Just like, again, Debbie said, the statue of Stalin has to be in that museum, so they have to thank him everywhere. Well, those people who are writing those amateur songs, they thank him everywhere in every song. Now, speaking of uh, censors and Soviet censors, of course, an important context for the materials that I'm looking at during the war is that these songs collected in the 40s, and they need to be discussed in the context of Soviet ideology and society, and of course, to be critiqued from the position of Soviet censorship and numerous restrictions. What could a song say? How, so imagine that situation that somebody comes to a shtetl or a small town, finds a, a person who would sing Yiddish songs and ask them to sing those songs on record. The person who is asked to do that has to make a decision. What are they going to sing? Because nobody is forcing you to sing. The person who listens to that song has to make a decision whether or not they're going to write down what they hear. And the, uh, what we see on paper is a product of those double rounds of self-censorship. First the informant, and then somebody who records that song. So people perceive folklore collectors, I think rightly so, as representatives of the government. And uh, they really had to think about what they're going to sing. So what we have here is not the pure voice of people, whatever that means, but a product produced during the time of war and presented in the context of complexities of that period. Now, I have a lot of evidence from this archive of the censorship and editorial process and how they actually worked with the materials that they created. It did go from, through a lot of censorship. But interestingly, Soviet censors of the 1940s unlike their colleagues in the 1930s who were frantically inserting Stalin everywhere, had to take out too much of the Jewish praise for Stalin from these songs. They had to tone down the unapologetically Jewish nature of these songs. 
They're not crazy about so many references to the proclamation such as Jewish people will live forever, even if it involved cursing Hitler and praising Stalin. I want to show you the process of uh, how it happened, an example of one song. The song was, uh, um, again, recorded in Kazakhstan in 1945 uh, from an anonymous source, and it's called Shalachmonis for Hitler, Purim Good Gifts for Hitler. So I'm going to um, play to you, this is the original, the first one, I'm going to play to you the last the 20 seconds of that song where uh, the, the author of the song tells, hit, tells Hitler that he will not succeed, but I hope the subtitles work. <laughs> So uh, this is uh, the song, the ends of Amisrael Chai, as you might have heard. Uh, the people of the people of Israel lived, and it's performed in a very dramatic manner by Pstoy Karalenka, the artist who I work with on this project. And it's filmed in an even more dramatic way by Russian television. So the, really, this line is the heart of the song, Jewish people should live, Amisrael Chai. So it all looks good and natural, and the audience loves that, except for one little footnote. Originally, Am Israel High was not in the song. So when, um, <laughs> when I found the original type taf, for which I was very grateful, it looked like this. If, one of, if you read Yiddish, you see that it ends with the soft but sign of Homan's bomb. Your end, Hitler's end, will be on the Haman's tree. So when I gave these lyrics to Psoy Korolenko, he read it and he said to me, you know, there's one last line missing. I want to add it. I said, no way. You know, historical material has to be saying a historical material. He says, well, it doesn't go. It has to confuse something. So he just said, okay, I'm going to add Amos Royal High. I was very against this idea because I believe that adding this line betrays the spirit of the song, the spirit of the project and the spirit of the time, but it worked very well artistically, so I learned to live with this, plus it didn't hurt all the publicity we got. <laughs> now, a year later, however, I found the handwritten original of this song in that same archive. I'm going to show it to you. And guess what? <laughs> um, so the last line is there, I'm a Royal High. And uh, originally was cut out, out, I don't know by who, by Barry, Marcia Berigovsky, who was the head of this ethnomusicological project by a censor, I don't know who. Probably for the same reasons I was against including it into the song. It made it too unapologetically Jewish, too nationalist, too happy about the eternal life of the Jewish people. But the story of the song does not end here. A version of it was published later in Sovietish Hameland in 1968 under a different title. Uh, the title, they took out most of the Haman, most of the other stuff. And, of course, the last lines here, you see my fault for they design, Amos Royal High is no longer there. So what we see here is that Soviet Yiddish celebration of 1968 already couldn't handle the Soviet Yiddish joy of 1945. So um, another thing that uh, was cut from this particular song and from many others, but we, know we don't have Soviet, Sh Soviet Shamelot published only seven of uh, hundreds of songs from this archive. And uh, one thing that was cut from them is I think their spirit and their soul which was represented in their humor. Uh, one thing that was surprising in finding the reading the documents created in Yiddish during World War II, from sometimes from the occupied uh, um, territories and sometimes from the armies, that how much humor was in them. And um, 
this, the nature of that humor is, uh, I think, quite fascinating. It's very crude, it's bold, it's physical. It's like the description of this violence. Um, and uh, we see Germans running away with their pants down, very often in their songs, with their pants soiled, with, uh, soiled from fear. Hitler is often portrayed as a woman, the worst kind of offense, of course, who cries and complains. And the nature of that humor is quite juvenile. I mean, my kids appreciate the poopy and the humor that, that made the songs very like, relevant and interesting and funny to them. And I was thinking quite a bit about this, and then I realized, well, a lot of those songs were recorded from children. They were recorded from young people and from children who found that kind of humor uh, relevant to them. And uh, one... Uh, um, Example that the last example that I will show you of these songs from this material is uh, as also dip, uh, has a lot of humor in it, and you'll see a different aspect of it uh, here as well. But it also talks about the victory, the victory of uh, uh, in, in World War II. And here you see the victory celebration portrayed in the form of a new wedding. In fact, the song itself is called the Denaya Hasana, the new wedding. It is recorded, uh, yes, that's how it looks like in the archive. Um, it was uh, recorded from a school child named Clara Rosenberg, a student of school number 18 in Mogilov Podolsk. And it was recorded in December 1944. So Psoe recorded the song for me uh, two days ago, I didn't have the record of that, but he's performing in some club in Israel, his solo concert. And I, I said to him, I need this for the presentation. And he said, well, it's a Russian concert about something. And I said, just sing it, nobody will care. So this is, <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> I hope that this will uh, work. And I apologize, the subtitles are jumping a little bit. It's a short <laughs> So this is the, the premiere of that song. So as you can see, the bride is Katyusha. As I don't know if everyone knows, but Katyusha is uh, the brand of a machine gun. Uh, and that machine gun is a celebrated, celebrated in many Soviet songs. It's uh, named after a young woman, Katyusha, who was a character actually in another Soviet uh, song written by Matvey Blanter in 1938. But um, uh, that song and that, and that song have nothing in common. But uh, what's important is that is the relationship to the machine gun. One uh, feature of these songs is that they love their guns. I would say they love their guns a lot more than they love their women or love their, miss their loved ones. So this is the object of affection. And they call it uh, in, in the good Yiddish word pulimyot uh, in all the songs, the Russian word for machine gun. And uh, this admiration of a machine gun is understandable because as you can think about this 1943, 1944, not so many Jews in Europe, to put it mildly, can have a gun and to fight the war. And it is a big deal and Soviet Yiddish songs of the time celebrate that. Now, the most optimistic, the most humorous, the boldest and the funniest Yiddish songs celebrated the, Yiddish, uh, the um, Soviet victory in World War II appeared before the victory actually happened. Uh, it, they, they were written uh, while Jews were still losing the war against fascism. Well before, for example, that Hungarian Jews were rounded up to go to Auschwitz. That's when we have the first Soviet Yiddish celebration songs. 
Also, at that time, the scope of destruction of the Jewish communities in the Soviet Union was not fully known to authors of the songs. And the songs celebrated the end of the war and the end of their displacement. Many of them say, well, now we can go home, because of course they're writing that in Central Asia, they want to go home. They don't talk so much about the destruction of uh, uh, the Jewish communities in Ukraine and Belarus. So the function of the songs is to give hope rather than celebrate the actual victory. Later songs in Yiddish written 1946, 47, and 48 rarely celebrate victory with such enthusiasm. Instead, they talk about staying alive, but almost every song mentions the dead, dead children, dead spouses, more often dead wives than dead husbands. As for Jewish women who remained under German occupation, the chances of survival were much lower than for the men who went to serve in the army. Uh, they are mourning a lot more than they're celebrating in Yiddish victory songs written after 1945. All these Yiddish songs call for ultimate revenge against the German army. They're not invested into this never again motto, which became a staple of the Holocaust education in the West, since Mayor Kahane used it in his book in 1972, entitled, you know, Never Again, a Program for Survival. Although, you know, um, they say that Never Again was written in Buchenwald in 1945, but Soviet Yiddish songs are not talking about this. Of course, they don't want anything like this to happen again, but only because all those people who committed violence against Jews should be killed. The story, the songs are not the story of forgiveness. In fact, they tell the story of revenge and unforgiveness. And it is their ultimate fe feature that did not fit the memory of the Holocaust that happened outside of the Soviet Union, but also uh, by 1949 in the Soviet Union itself, it also did not fit because public displays of Yiddish culture became very limited due to the changed government policies towards Jews. Stalin, who the songs praised so much in 1944, 46, even 47, uh, turns, uh, changes his policies towards Jews and uh, now they face discrimination, restrictions, and associate being Jewish, uh, begin to associate being Jewish almost entirely with uh, misfortune. Even scholars who collected this material, starting with Moisey Berigovsky and many others, were arrested uh, in 1949 and some in 1950, sent to jail, and uh, Eli Spivak was the head of the cabinet, died in jail. Berigovsky was released, uh, didn't talk about his work during World War II. He prepared his archive for um, uh, for preservation, but uh, that part of his uh, of of, uh, of the material of his work that he did during World War II was not in his possession. That was seized but as part of the cabinet's uh, archive and uh, he, uh, only released in the late 1990s. The songs were destined for obscurity and forgetting, but. Analyzed today, they present a fascinating time capsule and show how a diverse group of Soviet Jewish amateur authors used poetry, humor, and music to document and make sense of the war during the war, during the time when people still did not know how to talk about it, and during the time when they still could, which is essentially a window between 1941 and 48. If they chose to tell their story after the war, and even after the collapse of the Soviet Union, when most Soviet Jewish testimonies were collected, they already did not talk about their sentiments of 1943, because they might have forgotten them, or because the historical circumstances changed. For example, it might have seemed strange to them to tell a story in which Stalin was the hero, which protected Jews, as we heard in the song, rather than the perpetrator of Soviet discriminatory policies against Jews. Studying Yiddish folklore that was composed during the war gives voice to people who are normally not heard, uneducated and undereducated, women, young people, those Jews who fought and thought in Yiddish, and most importantly, those Jews who either, I know, I know, who either did not tell their story because they believed their ordeal was not as important or as interesting as others or they were killed. And we have a lot of evidence of many of the authors of these songs were killed. And we would not know anything about them, sorry, um, 
unless we read this song. Although none of the authors of the songs lived to see them performed, and many did not live to see the end of the war, their songs give us a chance to see them just as they wanted to be seen, as people who were able to find humor in things that killed them and find hope in the midst of darkness. Above all, as people, it's my mother calling from Russia, I'm sorry, she will call five times. Um, above all, <laughs> It's true. <laughs> um, above all, as people who managed to fight off Hitler, an accomplishment that we indeed should never forget. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I would like to thank the organizers of the project uh, for inviting me to participate and also even for giving the possibility to present here today my paper. <clears throat> uh, the example of Babi Yar in Kiev. Where until 1976, uh, there was no monument to the victims of the Holocaust, for many years has affected the formulation both in the West and among Soviet Jews of the discourse in regard to memorialization. The lack of a monument at Babi Yar <coughs> was incorrectly perceived as reflecting a typical, indeed, a general Soviet phenomenon. Representative of this view was the scholar Rebecca Goldberg in her article on memorialization of the Holocaust in Ukraine. Goldberg viewed the memorial activity of Soviet Jews from the 1950s through the 1970s as efforts of a few individuals who took great personal risk. She wrote, I quote, in a rare case, Cases, individual survivors took the initiative to establish Holocaust memorials despite the climate of fear and suspicion perpetuated by post-war Soviet policy, end of quote. <clears throat> A nice widespread view in regard to the Holocaust memorials in the Soviet Union claims that even when Jews succeeded in erecting monuments, <clears throat> uh, sorry, inscriptions spoke only about innocent Soviet citizens and that the monuments conveyed no Jewish ethnic content. Thus, the engraving on Jewish monuments of Jewish symbols was supposedly absolutely taboo. In his book, Bloodlands, Timothy Snyder makes the following generalization about the totality of Soviet control over all spheres of Jewish public life in the post-war years. I quote, in the post-war Soviet Union, memorials, obelisks, could not have stars of David and only five-pointed red stars. Such generalizations, uh, which were extended to include the whole Soviet period and the whole Soviet bloc, reinforced one of the main stereotypes regarding the contents of Jewish Holocaust memorial activity. Surprisingly, the view about the total ban of memorializa on memorialization of the victims of the Holocaust was widespread even among a large segment of Soviet Jews themselves, especially in the 1970s and early 1980s. Convinced of the comprehensiveness of Soviet anti-Jewish policy, such Jews were not inclined to recognize that the success of Holocaust memorialization largely depended on the concrete actions of the Jews themselves. 
the idea of the forgetting or silencing of the Holocaust that was expressed in the line, there is no monument over Babi Yar in Evgeny Yevtushenko's famous 1961 poem, basically corresponded to the views of Soviet Jews about their situation in the USSR. A different picture was given in concluding lines of the popular 1978 Soviet novel of Anatoly Rybakov, Тяжелый песок, Heavy Sand. This work contains a description of an actual Holocaust monument with obvious Jewish content. Uh, the Hebrew inscription on the monument, which was erected at the Jewish cemetery of Shores, concludes with citation from the book of Prophet Joel. The Hebrew text says, Ponit menu at samot ha yehudim ha gdoshim yoter mimea ish in regu al yedei ha rotschim ha germanim bishnat tafshin bet ve nikete damam lo nikete. The translation is, Here are buried the bones of Jewish kedoshim, the term will be discussed later, more than 100 of them who were killed by the German murderers in 1942 and I will take revenge for their blood, which has not yet been avenged. The conception, both in the West and the Israel, about the lack of Holocaust mon monuments with Jewish content is largely based on the Cold War views of Soviet Jews as ethnically amorphous, atomized group that was indifferent to everything specifically Jewish. They were considered to be Jews of silence when who were not prepared to undertake any informal, self-organized activity in public. The view about the lack of Jewish memorial activity in the USSR remained dominant despite the publication outside of the USSR, the dozens of photographs of monuments with Jewish content. However, information is now available to us about 725 cities, towns, and visitors, villages of the territory of the former Soviet Union where by the time of the disintegration of the Soviet Union, one or more monuments had been erected to local victims of the Holocaust. On the basis of material of the Untold Stories website of Yad Vashem's uh, project, uh, one can draw a significant conclusion. During the Soviet period, in at least uh, 46 percent of the locations where there had been a considerable compact Jewish population, Jews who had orgi originated from these places, united to commemorate the memory of their dear ones who had been murdered in the Holocaust. Many Jews made fin financial contribution to the erection of monuments. For example, in Chervin in Belarus, 300 52 Jewish families from 47 locations in the Soviet Union contributed money for the erection of a local monument. If one extrapolated from this figure, one may conclude that in the course of the entire Soviet period, tens of thousands of Jews probably contributed to this physical memorialization of victims of, victims of the Holocaust. This informal, grassroots, ethnically oriented activity was clearly a mass phenomenon. For example, many people took part in a memorial ceremony uh, took place in small town of Shedrin uh, in Belarus. What this means is that there were many separate groups united by their understanding of two things. First, that their dear ones had been murdered as Jews, and second, that only fellow Jews would memorialize them. Also, it is likely that in some cases, some groups may have influenced others. This activity was basically local and uncoordinated. Throughout the Soviet period, the authorities were steadfast in maintaining silence about the Holocaust as a separate aspect of World War II. This official point of view insisted that Jews in the Soviet Union were murdered as Soviet citizens. Therefore, it was considered politically incorrect to set them apart according to their ethnic origin. Such an approach significantly hampered all Soviet Jewish Holocaust memorial activity. However, it should be stressed that such ideas were nowhere formally prescribed and therefore did not create an 
all encompassed official policy. In other words, they did not become the basis for ex exclusively negative decision concerning all Jewish memorial initiatives in all locations. For this reason, Jewish memorial activity took place in a kind of gray zone, uh, one that made it impossible to navigate between permitted activities and the expressions and those that were definitely banned. Success in erecting a monument to Holocaust victims largely depended on Jewish understanding of the rules by which one dealt with the local Soviet leadership. On taking advantage of the integration of many Jews in Soviet economic life and their connections with representatives of the local authorities and also the willingness of Jews to exert pressure of these authorities. This was done by going over the letters heads with appeals to higher government and party officials. Such pressure was sometimes effective mainly in regard to erecting monuments, but on the whole was not very effective in regard to including ethnic elements on the monuments. However, according to some local data, approximately one third of the monument commemorating Jewish victims did have some Jewish content. First of all, these are monuments that have ethnic indicators, including inscriptions in Yiddish or Hebrew. Of particular importance was the Star of David. Sometimes this symbol was accompanied a Jewish text, but in other times it was an actual physical component of the monument itself. For example, in Volochysk, Ukraine, the monument was constructed on the base uh, of a large stone Star of David. Uh, Jews were far from always permitted to engrave his Jewish symbol on their monuments. When they were denied permission, they sometimes resorted to depict it elsewhere. In Babruisk, uh, in Babruisk it was depicted on the temporary plaque. In Stalpci, uh, there were stars of David constructed from stones on both sides of the monuments. The menorah was another obvious Jewish symbol that was employed also less frequently along with two tables of the Ten Commandments, as it was done in Volochysk. <coughs> in addition, there were direct or indirect indications that those murdered or reburred at the sites where monuments were located were Jews. Sometimes the word Jews on Jewish was replaced by a euphemism such as ghetto inmates, as was the case of monuments erected at the murder sites of the Jews of Medzhivosh and Smolensk. One should also recognize as Jewish content the citation in Russian of phrase from Jewish religion texts and the listing of Jewish names of victims. <coughs> Jewish memorial activity has been engaged in by people of various outlooks. They included both the, of the, by those who demonstrated lo total loyalty to the Soviet regime and by those who did not con uh, conceal their disagreement with Soviet policy in regard to, to Jews. All illustration of the latter is the fact that Jewish activists, including refuseniks, played an active role in the memorial ceremonies held in Riga, Kiev, and Minsk in the 1960s and the 1970s. However, on the whole, memorial activity was illegal, at times possibly unofficial, but nevertheless not banned, banned activity. Many of those who participated in the memorialization of the victims of the Holocaust basically accepted Soviet values. For example, they appreciated the role of the Red Army, realizing that many Soviet Jews owed their lives to the Soviet troops, ultimately victory over the Nazis. Thus, it is more accurate to speak not of counter memory about the Holocaust, that it is to speak of a parallel memory, one that combined memory of the murdered Jews with the official narrative about the Soviet victory over Nazi Germany. Jewish efforts were far from always successful, often encountering barriers that could not be overcome. At the same time, it is not clear to what extent the lack of Jewish content at a noticeable 
element in the monuments was the result of a direct restrictive policy of the part of the Soviet authorities, of which there are numerous examples. Nor it is clear to what degree Jews expect, expecting negative reaction of the authorities from the beginning restricted themselves in regard to Jewish content. Indeed, for many Jews, the act of demarking the murder sites, i.e. fencing uh, of the graves to prevent cows and goats from grazing there or to keep our grave robbers searching for gold was an important goal. This was possibly as important as demonstrating to themselves, to the surrounding population and authorities, their devotion to their ethnic values. The most liberal period in the terms of the Jewish content was the last years of the war and the first post-war years, i.e. 1944-1940. Seven, when the mobilizing pr propaganda model of the war years continued to operate by inertia. In this context, also apparently to a lesser extent, it was considered legit legitimate to make use of religious, reference, religious references. During this time, many monuments included direct quotes or easily recognizable paraphrases of biblical texts or Jewish prayers. Also, to a lesser extent, monuments with similar content were also erected from 1954 uh, to the 1960s during the Khrushchev period and the early Brezhnev years. Rare monuments with Jewish religious citation were erected even during the Brezhnev stagnation, the most difficult period for Jewish memorial activity uh, after Stalinist uh, anti-Semitic period of 1948-1953. Uh, uh, the time of stagnation was notorious for its intensive anti-Zionist propaganda that was characteristic of Soviet policy after the break in diplomatic relations between the USSR and Israel in 1967, and especially in con conjunction with the ex extensive immigration of Soviet Jews in the 1970s, which Professor Gittelman talked today. During the, uh, those years, there, that there was a considerable erasing of the star of David from monuments, which was largely perceived by Soviet officials as a symbol of the hated entity of the Jewish uh, state. Uh, however, even then, the, the Judaizing of Jewish monuments was not total. Moreover, it should be noted that in the number of locations, the presence of other Jewish symbols, such as menorah or inscription in Hebrew or Yiddish, as well as direct, direct references in Russian text to the fact that those murdered at those sites were Jews, outlasted the Soviet period. In the realm of literature, the metaphor of the text as a monument, as a memorial, has often served as an, as an alternative to actual physical monuments. An obvious example of the phenomenon is the Iskerbicher Memorial Books. This phenomenon reflected the physical distance of uh, many of the bearers of memory from the places where their family members, friends, and fellow residents were murdered. This contrasted with the situation in the USSR, where the murder sites were basically ac accessible to those who mourned the victims and therefore became place of actual rather than textual memorial activity. <clears throat> Moreover, in the Soviet Union, written texts sometimes were substantial components of physical monuments. The particular phraseology often combined elements of traditional Jewish memorial culture with contemporary attempts to commemorate the Holocaust. For obvious reasons, monument inscriptions describe the victims in very positive terms while ascribing highly negative features of the Nazis who were highlighted as enemies of the Jews. The same situation as in the songs uh, that Anna said. Uh, frequently, the victims were associated with the medieval concept of Kiddush Hashem, Hebrew for sanctification of God's name. In modern times, the term Kedoshim, saints of those who died for sanctification of God's name, has been used to refer to Jews who were murdered in pogroms. Traditional negative images were utilized to refer to the Nazis. One example of the latter was the use of the phrase Imach Shmo may his memory and name 
be blotted out. That was commonly uh, added as an epithet to personal enemy of Jews to refer to Hitler. Sometimes this expression appeared on monuments in the plural to refer to Hitler's followers in general. Another expression of Jewish revulsion towards Hitler was to refer to him as a man of modern times. An example of this appears on the, uh, on the monument in Sirotina, which contains the word combination Hitler Harasha, Hitler the evil one, where the second Hebrew word is a direct quote from the prayer for the holiday of Purim, celebrating the Jews being saved from Haman the evil one. Sometimes <coughs> Holocaust monument inscriptions went beyond the framework of such a simple just opposition of victims and executioners, and the depiction of murdered Jews was borrowed directly from biblical texts. Thus, the victims were characterized as righteous people, had mimim vehayesharim, innocent and upright, in a citation for the first line of the book of Job, whose tragic hero is characterized in the singular as tam vehayashar. This phrase has often been used on Jewish tombstone to characterize the deceased. Another frequent biblical citation about Saul and Jonathan from the book of Samuel 2. Nehavim vehanenimim be hayehev uvematam lo nifrado. Beloved and pleasing in their life, they were not reported in their deaths. Uh, this citation appears in Hebrew in Stanislavov, Ivano Frankivs, and Azarinci, both in Ukraine, and in Russian translation in Dzerzhinsk in Belarus. Also noteworthy are the inscriptions on monuments in Pechora and Bele, in Bele Tserkov, both in Ukraine. These inscriptions uh, reflect a strong sense of uh, continued national identity in the 1970s, the years of Brezhnev stagnations. Both of the Hebrew inscriptions on these monuments concluded with the same words from Psalms. May God remember them for God and may be spilled blood of his servants be avenged. In conclusion, in regard to the memory of the victims of the Holocaust and the ways on commemorating them, Many Soviet Jews displayed quite a higher level of loyalty to their own ethnic values. Despite the specifics of the Soviet condition that discouraged Jewish memorial activity, in a comparatively large number of cases, Jews did succeed in commemorating their fellow Jews. In doing so, they demonstrated a high level of spontaneous grassroots organizational activity one that sometimes was even higher than that of the surrounding non-Jewish population. The scope of memorial activity of Soviet Jews provides us with the reason to revise our understanding of Soviet policy towards the Jews, specifically in general to reconsider the widespread view of a totalistic Soviet control of the life of, this, of its citizens. The noteworthy success of Jews in memorializing the victims of the Holocaust demonstrates that even under Soviet condition, it was possible to find niches for grassroots ethnic activity. A large role in this activity was due to a factor of subjectivity, i.e. the perception of individual Soviet Jews who achieved what others considered impossible. Thank you. Good afternoon. And now it's a, a short footnote about food. By the time of the 1917 uh, revolution, the Bolsheviks didn't have any coherent strategy for future of Russia's Jews. And it seems seriously believed that in a socialist environment, all issues associated with this group of the population should be solved just by themselves. When it became clear that uh, the post-revolutionary reality nevertheless uh, demanded special atten attention to this pop population segment, the establishment and activity of the People's Commissariat for Jewish Affairs and the Jewish sections of the Bolshevik Party set the tone for the state policy, a radical ideological, cultural, and social modification of Jewish forms of life in the country. 
transition from parasitic occupation in shtetls to productive activity in socialist society. The construction and sustainment of a new Jew continued almost until the decline of the Soviet Union in 1991. To this end, Soviet ideologists sought to eliminate all religious elements of traditional Jewish life. At the same time, they tended to consider Yiddish language, literature, and theater worthy uh, for limited preservation and even further development. Any activity in the secular uh, uh, cultural field fell under an unwritten but unbroken ban only during uh, several years in the late 1940s and early 1950s. Jewish foodways also found appreciation as a valuable form of cultural expression. For a short while, the uh, commissariat of, for Jewish affairs shared premises with, the, with Moscow-based Zionist organizations, and the commissariat's staff, headed by Shimon Dimonstein, a former student of a Lubavitch yeshiva, didn't see a problem problems in eating at the same kosher canteen. Elisa ben Parat's uh, analytic portrayal of Soviet Minsk shows that throughout the 1920s, uh, the city continued to consume almost exclusively kosher meat. The rebranding of the shtetls into towns and villages certainly didn't bring immediate changes in the foodways of their residents. In general, however, communists uh, as well as other politically reliable uh, uh, segments of the Jewish population were not supposed to burden themselves with following the, uh, uh, the old dietary rules, although the new regime tried to show its readiness to tolerate some vestiges of religious traditions, especially if they survived exclusively among the elderly people. Critical food uh, shortages in the early years of the Soviet regime, most notably during the uh, military communism period, it's the early 19, in 1918, 1921, made it onerous to observe any dietary restrictions. A, a, a memoir of the period, uh, we, we, we find in the memoir of the period that in their hungry desperation, Moscow Jewish, Moscow-based Jewish intellectuals were happy to get horse beef uh, or a uh, horse meat, or as a treat, even cat and dog meat. In Moscow, no flour was available for baking matzo, so during Passover, many observant Jews followed the local rabbi's advice, eating rice and peas instead. In 1919, they could receive some amount of matzo as their bread ration uh, allowance. The situation improved with the uh, commencement of the new economic policy, during which the government permitted uh, opening of private enterprises. It, it again began, uh, became a challenge to keep kosher in the 1930s, when forced collectivization of agriculture led to a great loss in production of grain, meat, and milk. Cows had been uh, confiscated by the state, and their slaughter was heavily regulated. Therefore, kosher beef remained almost inaccessible. Legal kosher butchers continued to exist in certain localities specializing in slaughtering almost always chickens. For instance, in 1935, Kiev had 21 butchers for the Jewish population of over 220,000. In 1939, the American chess player, Samuel Rashevsky, experienced problems with finding kosher food when he participated in a tournament in Moscow and Leningrad. The New York Herald Tribune reported, I quote, the hospitable Soviet authorities find complying with the orthodox kosher diet an unsolvable problem, and the champion has been reduced to a diet something like Mahatma Gandhi's, <laughs> one of goat's milk. In the 19th, later, I for sure, later they found a family that, that had some kosher food in, in Leningrad. In the 1930s, Jewish dishes cooked uh, following Jewish recipes rather than religious dietary laws were supposed to add national spice to the Jewish autonomous re region, better known as Berbijan, 
established in the far eastern corner of uh, Siberia and Russia. A late Soviet cookbook represented Jewish fare, gefilte fish, tzimes, forschmark, it's, uh, chopped herring, as an ethno-territorial phenomenon. Interestingly, it appeared in a chapter dedicated to food traditions of the Far East. This reflected the Birabidzhan-centered ideological model, which uh, dogmatically linked the entire Soviet Jewish population to its uh, heartland uh, in, in Birabidzhan. Characteristically, according to the universal system developed for the Soviet library catalogs, Yiddish books and their translations were placed among the literatures of Far Eastern peoples. <laughs> Birabidzhan was built to house a militantly secular uh, society, so a Polish-Jewish activist, he was almost a communist, who visited the area in 1934, found or, or chose to see uh, there are only several men who observed uh, Shabbat and didn't eat pork. Ironically, all of them were Subotniks or Judaized Russians. According to David Haid, a Russian Jewish writer, by the mid 1930s, young Belabijanas knew very little about the Jewish traditions and were bemused when a group of Subotniks settled in one of the collective farms of Belabijan. Some local Jews even offered in jest their services, a Shabbos Goem, or do I have to explain it? Uh, uh, <laughs> it didn't mean, however, that the Jewish resettlers had uh, forgotten the recipes of uh, their traditional dishes. In February 1936, when Lazar Kaganovich, Stalin's uh, Jewish lieutenant, visited Berbidzhan, housewives cooked for him gefilte fish. In the event, the guest who traveled in style, accompanied by a cook, didn't touch the local food. Nevertheless, next year, when the secret police arrested the party boss of Birabidzhan, in the wave of Stalinist purges, his wife was grotesquely accused of trying to poison Kaganovich with gefilte fish of her cooking. <laughs> the issue of gefilte fish emerged also during the visit of another Jewish guest, Polina Zimchuzina, her real name was Pearl Karpovska, whose non-Jewish husband, already was mentioned here, Vyacheslav uh, 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 Molotov, would in August 1939 come for himself a, a place in history by signing the Soviet-German pact. Zimchuzina herself, a high-ranking state functionary, at that time she headed a department at the Ministry of Food Industry, expressed her disappointment that this quintessential Jewish dish didn't uh, appear on the menu of the apparently only Berabidzhan restaurant. In the 1970s, the restaurant uh, of the Berabidzhan Hotel Vostok could serve, and I quote from uh, travel notes of an American uh, journalist, at, uh, at dinner described as a Jewish cuisine, which included something that might be called Siberian gefilte fish chicken soup and smoked salmon. Perez Markish's uh, documentary story, Family, published in the proletarian May day in 1935, so exactly 82 years ago, in the second uh, important Soviet daily is Vestia, is set in Leningrad in a Jewish household whose head is a 67-year-old factory worker and a veteran of the revolutionary movement. Here is Markish's description of this family's dinner table. And I quote, it blossomed with the most exquisite choice of traditional Jewish dishes. There was excellently stuffed fish, chopped liver, amazingly prepared horseradish, and pork cutlets of unparalleled fatness. <laughs> Thus, pork cutlets already feature as a part of the new Jewish tradition. In his last novel, it was published, of course, after his uh, execution, his death, uh, the writer uh, devotes much space to show social adjustment of Polish Jews who fled to the Soviet Union following the beginning of uh, World War II. Some of his characters, former Polish uh, uh, Jewish citizens, wind up in a rural, uh, in the, 
uh, in industrial city in the Urals, where the majority of them managed to quell their prejudice to tomato, which they previously regarded as a gentile variety of food. I believe that my grandfather never touched tomato. In, it, it's not mentioned for obvious reasons in, in the Talmud. In, in, in general, the dietary preferences of Marcus's literary characters undergo changes to the effect that in the spring of 1942, they celebrate the Passover with the Siberian dumplings, pilmeni, rather than with traditional food. Although the Soviet food mainstream had absorbed some elements of Jewish cuisine and tzimis, even uh, enriched the Russian language uh, with the word tzimis, meaning a very good, nice thing, better tzimis, yeah, uh, they uh, never became as important as, for instance, the Caucasian-style shashlik, shish kebab, or the Central Asian plov, conglomeration of rice, vegetables, and meat beets uh, swimming in meat. I give the whole recipe. Uh, traditionally lamb fat of oil. In any case, challah, Jewish-styled braided bread, could be bought in many Soviet food stores as, as late as at least the 1950s or even later. A Soviet textbook for students of food uh, merchandising published in 1955 describes the variety of pokeless sausages known as Yvaiske Kalbasa, a Jewish sausage. I have childhood memories that Yvaiske Kalbasa with a bit of garlic taste and challah could be bought in my home city of Zaporozhye and its neighboring city of Dnipropetrovsk in Ukraine. Of course, Yvaiske Kalbasa is now available in Brighton Beach in, in any variety. <laughs> challah might uh, have disappeared at least temporary from bakeries during food shortages in 1962 and 1963, when white bread generally became a rare commodity. During the same period of time, which saw an intensive anti-religious campaign, all forms of organized production of matzo fell under a ban. Early 1956, a delegation of uh, the Rabbinical uh, Council of America reported that in Moscow and Leningrad, a state-run bakery was allowed to bake matzo under rabbinical supervision, while in some other cities, people would purchase flour and bring it to the synagogue where a small bakery had been set up. The ban introduced in the early 1960s hardly affected our or many other families who baked matzo themselves at home. I also remember that in the, in the late 1950s and early 1960s, Two slaughterers, presumably employed by the market administration, shared a hut at the old market of Zaporozhye. One of the slaughters was Jewish. A religious slaughterer uh, was at hand also at the Berbidzhan market. I don't remember it. I took it from literature. The situation was uh, different in some outskirts of the Soviet Union, especially among non-Ashkenazic Jews. Thus, in the, 19, uh, the, the 1956 delegation of the same rabbinical council reported that Georgia was the only place in the Soviet Union where they saw kosher butcher shops. In general, the Georgian Jews, and I quote, were man, man, maintaining their ancient religious customs hardly touched by the Soviet regime, end of quote. In the 1950s in Frunze, and we had a paper on Frunze, uh, uh, then uh, it was the old name of the uh, capital of the Kyrgyz Republic, a state-run gastronome food store uh, sold kosher meat. In Tajikistan and Uzbekistan, the power that be tended uh, to not interfere with Jewish ritual slaughtering. As I, I have already mentioned, I was born and grew up in the Ukrainian city of Zaporozhye. My extended family combined Soviet and kosher to Borovan uh, term. My father was a member of the Communist Party, a commissar during World War II, a history teacher before and after the war. My pious grandfather, with whom we lived in the same apartment, unofficially practiced as a religious butcher. My mother and all her siblings were completely secular. In general, only many years later, when I already lived in Moscow, I met several seriously observant Jews who belonged to the generation of my parents, born in the first two decades of the 20th century. As long as my grandfather lived with us, that is the, the first uh, 10 years of my life, we ate kosher, sl uh, sl uh, 
kosher slaughtered chickens as well as sometimes ducks, geese, and turkey. The fowls would be brought alive, we would be bought alive at the market. Sometimes my mother would keep a goose on our balcony, force feeding it for a while, before asking her father to take the bird to the bathroom, which functioned also as his slaughterhouse. The aim of force feeding was to get better griveness or griveness, cracklings, and smalts or fat, rather than foie gras. For foie gras, nobody in our surroundings ever heard about it. <laughs> my, mother, my mother also cooked an excellent helzel, chicken neck skin stuffed with flour or whatever, schmaltz, onion, and some other ingredients. On our menu, there was a virtual item, marzipanes, marzipans. If I didn't want to eat something cooked by my mother, she would react by asking the same rhetorical question. What will to essen marzipanes? Do you prefer to eat marzipans? It is worth mentioning that my mother never saw a real marzipan, and I learned its taste many years later outside the Soviet Union. Alice Nachimovsky uh, wrote that the Jewish food tradition transformed and endured in the Soviet Union by and large, in a private kitchen rather than in a public space. Ultimately, this modified tradition, free from religious dietary restrictions, moved to public spaces, both in the former Soviet Union and the countries where former Soviet Jews had opened food stores, restaurants, and catering businesses. Non-kosher Jewish food, including dishes with pork, became a marker of post-Soviet uh, Jewry in the former Soviet Union, in Israel, United States, and Germany, and other countries. Striking hybrids of Jewish traditions and Soviet-style Jewishness can be observed in Brighton Beach, for example. Thus, during the Passover, some local restaurants don't serve bread, although the menu otherwise remains the same as on usual days. As a result, Matsume accompanies seafood and pork. The bulk of Brighton Beach restaurants remain closed on Yom Kippur and open after the nightfall and open after the nightfall for a completely non-kosher breakfast <laughs> or Plaznichny Uzen, festive dinner, as the restaurants market such very popular overbooked meals. As we say in Yiddish, a big isn't. <laughs> <laughs>